Today I'm going to talk about the very interesting behavior of those uh, solid microbes. Uh, and then, well, uh, before I start it, I would like to thank all my collaborators, uh, my lab mates, all the grants support this project, uh, particularly at GradCon committee to give me the chance to present here. So uh, this story, uh, besides the origin of life, it's more than like uh, how a life could adapt to beyond the, uh, the Earth. Particularly, uh, we already have the evidence that uh, on the Mars we have we found the liquid water in the uh, brine deposit. So, uh, make this salt-loving microbes could be the uh, very promising candidate to uh, survive or uh, colonize on, like for example, Mars. So on the Earth, actually, we already uh, sampled or studied uh, these uh, microbe communities all, all over the world. And then we call this, uh, if you're not familiar, halophiles, so the whole group of microbes. Called, uh, and here is an example of what uh, this kind of habitat looks like. So this area uh, connect to the seawater with a relative low concentration of the uh, salinity. And this area is a red color area, have a high salt uh, concentration. And this color is mainly because of those microbes living in those uh, region. And this small area is artificial salt and pond. So evaporate the liquid water to extract the uh, salt. Uh, so Normally, those regions will have the concentration gradient. And then some of those ponds will have a really high concentration. You can see they already started to crystallize. But across all those concentration gradient, uh, the halophile communities have been found. So one of the challenges for those microbes to survive in this type of environment is uh, resource limitation. Okay. However, uh, there is one potential resources might be available for them, uh, which is the extracellular DNA molecule. So if we think about DNA molecules, we first will think they are genetic information carrier. But actually, as a large organic molecule, they are all also uh, very nutrition, you could say that. Uh, and then where it come from, it could from you know, all the organisms, those individual, they die and those DNA uh, materials are all released from the cell. So basically, it exists uh, in all type of ecosystem and kind of abundant. And it has been found that uh, some microbe species will take this eDNA as nutritional supply. So the question is, is the halophile could do this? So the answer is yes. So this uh, experiment is performed in Dr. Popke's lab, showing by fitting this species, Halopharyx wikinii, which is the model species of halophiles. So they can grow on eDNA, but uh, the thing is, depends on where this DNA, eDNA come from. It's selectively picking. For example, here, uh, halopharynx will grow on the eDNA from itself, but it won't grow on the eDNA from herring or E. coli. So this results, uh, we want to ask, like, okay, what type of the eDNA they prefer? What's the characteristic of those consumed DNA molecules? Right. So talk about DNA molecules. So here I will mainly using two widely used characters to describe the features of DNA. One is this GC content. So DNA molecules have four bases, uh, ATGC. So GC content basically calculate the percentage of GC in certain region. Could be genome, chromosome, or any region we're interested in. Uh, Another thing uh, is the DNA mo uh, modification pattern, uh, specifically the methylation pattern. So here, these three uh, figures show three types of methylation. 
uh, for bacteria and archaea. So what type of methylation will happen or generate here depends on the methylation enzymes this species have uh, or carry. Uh, and then different methylation enzyme normally have a specific recognition motif, which is a small DNA regions. Uh, for example, later we'll talk about the methylation enzyme of halopharynx, which using this CTAGC tag motif as a recognition region. So to exam what type of uh, eDNA they prefer to take, we designed this experiment. So first, extract the community DNA from certain pond, and then part of it directly being sequenced. So we obtain this pre-feeding metagenome data, data. Another part used as eDNA source to feed the halopharynx. And after feeding treatment, we sequence the post-feeding uh, sample to obtain the uh, post-feeding metagenome. Then we'll compare this pre-feeding and post-feeding sample to check like uh, DNA features or DNA feature changes of those groups. So here is a summary of the uh, results. So this uh, purple, uh, this pink circle is the pre-feeding sample. Blue uh, circle is the post-feeding sample. So the overlap uh, area is those DNA occur in both samples. So they are like basically haven't been consumed, so we call the leftover group. And then this area is particularly interesting, is they only occurred in pre-feeding sample but disappear in post-feeding sample, so potentially being consumed. So we call the eaten group. And then things will repeat that experiment twice, so eventually we will obtain two replicates. And then the results are pretty consistent uh, there are about 8.3, 8.5% 8 of the DNA have been consumed. Then uh, next about the GC content of those groups. Uh, this purple curve is the uh, leftover group, which is pretty similar to this black curve is the uh, GC content distribution of the total community sample. However, the Eaton group, which is this uh, red orange curve showing uh, they have a they have bias towards the lower GC content indicate the halopharynx prefer to take the DNA with lower GC content. And since the the GC content of genome when we talk about that, it's it has it's basically species specific. So different species normally have different GC content on average for their genome. So we want to uh, check if this low GC content is contributed to by specific species. So next, uh, we do a taxonomy analysis to analyze the uh, composition of the, our sample. So here is the composition of the total community sample. Different color represents different uh, uh, general, so in this taxonomy is in genus level. And then the leftover group showing a very similar pattern to the entire community sample. However, this Eaton group is significantly different. Uh, and I check all the species in those general and I haven't found you know, specific species, uh, abundant species in this group have low GC content. So is this suggest this low GC content bias could uh, maybe just from like some region of the genome or have lower GC content and they take uh, that. Next, about the methylation pattern. So we already mentioned uh, halopharynx have this methylation enzyme using C tag motif. So uh, we then if the other species in this Eaton group also share this gene, then eventually they will generate similar uh, methylation pattern. So here we examine the presence, absence status of, those, uh, of this gene in all those uh, species in the Eaton group. And then if all the species in this genus have this gene, 
we color in dark purple. Uh, if none of the species in a genus have this gene, then we'll color in white. Uh, so to map the, the status here, we can show, uh, we can see a lot of uh, genus or species in this Eaton group actually share this uh, methylation enzyme. Uh, and we also connect uh, this uh, uh, presence, uh, absence status of this gene to this abundance change, changes of those group. So here, uh, this green arrow connect the genus if their proportion increased in Eaton group compared to the proportion in the entire community sample. Uh, and then the orange arrow connect uh, the opposite. So if this genus, the proportion decreased in the Eaton group compared to uh, the proportion in the entire community sample. Then we can see there is a, uh, a very strong correlation pattern here is almost all the green air arrow have a you know, cross bond to a dark purple dot here, where the orange arrow, yeah, they have like a white dot, so meaning they don't have this gene. So this results may suggest so sharing the similar methylation pattern could be a signal for to determine uh, if halopharynx will pick this gene or not. Uh, so a quick summary here. So halopharynx McKinney, I prefer to take the eDNA with lower GC content and similar methylation pattern. And with this information, we wonder if we uh, put those species sharing this uh, similar methylation pattern together to form a community, and they might form a uh, resource recycling system. Then this might be a really nice strategy to adapt those any source limited uh, environment, which you know, if this system can work, then I guess the <laughs> Hello File community may work better. Okay, so with that, I would like to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Hi, I was wondering if you looked for the, that specific motif in the not eaten organisms as well and found that it wasn't present. Uh, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but uh, because the, well, if we see, they actually, uh, so those groups are actually pretty similar to the total uh, community structure, uh, total community samples. So basically, uh, we already check if they uh, 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 the if those uh, uh, groups share that gene because you know in the Eaton group they actually have more uh, general standout compared to the the community sample so we did check those so they are already included sort of included in this group. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, uh, is there any um, other kind of DNA that the halopharynx likes to eat more than its own, um, or does it, it does it always go for its its own kind of DNA first, and then things that are similar? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we have some. Uh, before we do that, we have some hypotheses, like if they take the DNA from uh, you know uh, the taxonomy resources saying if they're from like close related species, but uh, it turns out it determined by the methylation pattern. But sharing the similar methylation pattern doesn't necessarily mean they are close related species. So uh, yeah, so like those. Uh, species in those, ge in those general, they sh they're sharing this meth uh, similar methylation pattern, but on the phylogeny, phylogenetic tree, they're not really clustering together, or they don't have those kind of patterns, they're just widely uh, spread 
across the entire phylogeny. Yeah. All right, one last question. Okay, so obviously you haven't done this here, but has anybody looked into how much of the DNA that's eaten is actually incorporated into the bacterial um, chromosome? Uh, you mean like map them to the, back to the? To yeah, like you'd have to do it with a monoculture and not like this community like you did here. Um. Um, yeah, not because uh, this group is not, uh, first is not just from one species. So, uh, well, definitely could try to, I, yeah, I haven't done that yet, but uh, I have those, like, uh, all the DNA, because this is, a, I have those metagenomic uh, samples from all those uh, generals then. Could yeah, no, I was just asking yeah. if anybody has done it with like a monoculture of one representative of one of these species that eats DNA. Oh, yeah, I haven't heard that. Because okay. for the hell files, those are, uh, all the, all those are, most, most of them, uh, except this one, I think most of them are archaea. And I think, as I know, besides Helopharyx vacinii, there are only few species that are successfully you know, can culture in the lab, and a lot of them are, you know, can really culture it, so, yeah. All right, thank you again. Thank you.